Hello, this is Dong Suk Shin, and I'm going to give you a little guided tour of the fortepiano that is owned by Gwendolyn Toth and me that you have just heard in today's concert. We players of early keyboard instruments generally have to play modern reproductions of harpsichords and fortepianos. There are just too few surviving available antiques to go around compared to, say, violins and cellos. As an aside, it should be noted that only 2-3% to of the fortepianos made by some of the most well-known early makers have survived into our time, and for many known makers famous in their own days, none of their instruments have survived so far as we know. So the fact that you have heard an antique 18th century fortepiano in this performance is very special indeed. I am going to show you how the action is pulled out of this and many other late 18th century Viennese or German fortepianos. In this particular instrument, I first have to remove the name board. Then the action has to be lowered in order to get it out, and many instruments have what is called a sled, which slides out from under the action, lowering it about an inch. Then I can carefully slide the action out of the instrument, making sure none of the keys are depressed so as not to break any hammers on the way out. As I press a key on the piano, you can see the very small wooden hammer that is only covered with a thin layer of deer hide come up. As it falls back down, you can see it being caught by a leather disc on a wire that is called a back check. That mechanism distinguished the pianos made by Johann Andreas Stein of Augsburg, whose pianos Mozart admired as a young man, which did not have a back check, versus the pianos made by Anton Walter of Vienna, which did have the back check. Without a back check, one could not play too loudly because the hammers could bounce back and hit the strings again inadvertently. Walter's incorporation of the back check allowed his pianos to be played more loudly, and I think that was one of the reasons why Mozart eventually bought a Walter in the last decade of his life, to play concertos with an orchestra. However, both types of pianos coexisted for many years. The best early Viennese and German fortepianos allow exquisite control of the dynamic range, soft to loud, because they have sensitive actions that have a light touch and a shallow key dip. Viennese pianos gained many pedals, sometimes as many as six to eight during Beethoven's lifetime, with many special effects, bassoons, drums, una corda, etc. However, when Beethoven was young, pianos usually only had one or two effects. The first was the knee lever, not a pedal, that raised the dampers off the strings, the equivalent of the right pedal on a modern piano. The other, usually operated with a knob that you pulled, had no equivalent on the modern piano called the moderator, it brings a strip of cloth between the hammers and strings, creating an ethereal, less bright, and slightly muted sound. I try to use either effect sparingly, especially the moderator, but you might have heard it in the second movement of the Beethoven trio when I used it in the section in E-flat minor. I will demonstrate various possibilities of sound on this piano with the same passage played with more or less the same touch. First, no knee lever or moderator. Now, with knee lever. Now, with moderator. Now, with the moderator and the knee lever. The maker of our piano is officially unknown. It is not signed with the customary plaque that would have had the name of the maker and a phrase like instrument maker in and the city where he lived and worked. This piano only has the initials K, B, and AP on the name board. This piano's maker has been called a follower of Ferdinand Hoffmann of Vienna. You will now see a series of photographs of details from this piano, always shown on the left, along with the wonderfully preserved Ferdinand Hoffmann piano from around 1785 at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, always shown on the right. You will see obvious decorative details that are identical in both pianos and there are many other details of its internal construction and the action that are very similar.
but it is also obvious that our piano is not a Ferdinand Hoffmann. However, over the years, I have found a maker who fits the bill. His name was Karl Benedict, Karl with a K, who ended up being an instrument maker in Graz. I have had the opportunity to examine two of the three known surviving signed pianos of Karl Benedict. One is in the Frederick Collection in Ashburnham, Massachusetts, and the other is in Petui in Slovenia. And again, in so many details, our piano is clearly related to these two. It is my belief that our piano was made by Carl Benedict around 1785 and is probably his earliest surviving piano. I suspect he may have worked in Ferdinand Hoffmann's piano-making shop in Vienna and made this instrument before he was a citizen of a city and a registered piano-maker, which would have allowed him to sign his instrument with the usual plaque. But he left his initials on the name board, which is a big clue as to his identity. I still don't know what A P means, however. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thanks and bye for now.